Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you today. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about when fencing and metapopulation management becomes a necessary tool for the conservation of wild cheetah populations. So it's important that we just start off with a little bit of uh, context. So South Africa's transition to democracy had substantial implications for uh, wild cheetah conservation. Uh, the Game Theft Act of 1991 was responsible for a, a change in land use from, from, from livestock farming to ecotourism, a major change in land use. And this act gave private landowners uh, ownership of wildlife under conditions of adequate fencing. So you could bring in, have your own private game reserve in South Africa on condition that you fenced yourself out of the greater agricultural landscape. And just, it just so happened at that time that there was this tourism boom in South Africa uh, after the end of apartheid. And uh, so, you know, um, up came the fences. The fences separated ecotourism from livestock farming. And um, yes, I mean, uh, these were, a lot of people consider them to be, you know, glorified zoos. They're very small, protected areas. But they were a, a win on three fronts, you know, from an environmental perspective, all the naturally occurring animals were reintroduced, the livestock was removed. From a social perspective, more people were employed per, per unit area and at a higher wage. And, um, you know, there was, these were areas that were previously, you know, the sites of uh, abuse of cheap labor. And now people from all over the world were coming to visit these remote areas and, and they were bringing with them foreign exchange, which was very valuable to our economy. I mean, a lot of these tourists were high-end tourists. They didn't want to go to Kruger National Park and uh, watch a lion sighting with 40 other vehicles. They wanted a private safari experience and they were willing to pay up to $1,000 per night per person to experience that. So, um, you know, even when our cheetahs escaped, um, you know, the cheetahs were at such high financial value and ecotourism value that helicopters were caught, called in to bring them, bring them back. And uh, so in the first 10 years of my, uh, ex uh, um, you know, uh, uh, conservation experience, I never worked in human wildlife conflict because the fences stopped that. And um, cheetah were introduced into 65 privately owned game reserves right across South Africa. The average size of these reserves was about 243 uh, uh, square kilometers, uh, smaller than the, the London metropolitan area. They could only hold about two prides of lion, about 15 leopards, and about six to eight cheetahs. And the first 31 reintroductions that I was involved in were, were all successful. I mean, that was quite straightforward. You brought the cheetahs in. Yes, we lost a few to lion. We lost a few to leopard. We lost a few to hyena. But, you know, generally, um, we still have resident populations at all of these 31 reintroduction sites. And this metapopulation has grown from 217 individuals in 2011 to over 500 today. Uh, we started at 41 reserves. We're now on 72. And we started working in just South Africa. And we've now expanded into Malawi, Mozambique, Zambia, and more recently, India. And, um, but then in 2021, we reached capacity with our, our metapopulation, and, and we had to find, identify new reintroduction sites to get rid of these surplus cheetahs. And, um, you know, we, we attempted our first reintroductions into unfenced systems. So for the first time, uh, we no longer had fences separating the cheetahs from humans and their agricultural practices. And I mean, it looks like cheetah heaven here, thousands of black lechwe in the, in the background, their perfect habitat. But of course, there were a lot of people now in these unfenced systems, and we were in for a nasty surprise. And of the 40 cheetah that we relocated to Zambia and to Mozambique into these unfenced systems, only 12 are alive today. So we encountered these nasty gin traps, um, you know, a lot of wire snaring, uh, we picked up three-legged cheetahs on our camera traps. Uh, we'd go uh, tracking the cheetah and we'd come across scenes like this. Um, you know, cheetahs completely killed and, 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 and skinned. And uh, it was, it was a, a, an introduction to human-wildlife conflict. And um, in this time, you know, I've obviously became more familiar with the uh, cheetah conservation literature. And I read this interesting book over here, which, which, which really gave me some, some good perspective um, on things. And um, 
So basically, if you look at the historical distribution range for cheetah, they occurred right across Africa except for the more forested regions. They occurred uh, across the Middle East all the way into the former Soviet Union and all the way eastwards into India. And um, it's quite interesting. Uh, over the past 13,000 years, uh, agriculture, of course, started here. The first plants and animals domesticated in the Middle East. And, and, and then by 7,000 years ago, um, you know, the first crops were domesticated in West Africa. And the full suite of domestic animals, cattle, sheep, goats, arrived in West Africa 4,000 years ago. And then, of course, human populations started to increase. And uh, these, these African farmers started to move eastwards and southwards, what anthropologists refer to as the Bantu expansion, hitting East Africa 2,500 years ago, hitting Southern Africa 1,500 years ago, and outcompeting more ecologically friendly hunter-gatherers that used to live in these areas. And so, so there's different levels of anthropogenic influence in these four geopolitical regions. So 13,000 years of agriculture and just 140 cheetah left in the whole of Asia and North Africa. Um, and contrast that to Southern Africa, where we've only had 1,500 years of agriculture and we've got 65% of the world's wild cheetah populations. So these broad-scale spatiotemporal trends suggest that the reduction of wild cheetah populations is a consequence, obviously, of the level of anthropogenic uh, in disturbance but more importantly, the duration of exposure to that influence, that disturbance. So in order to uh, test this hypothesis, uh, we used random forest modeli modeling to analyze the impacts of climatic variables, human population density, road density, protected area status, and livestock density on cheetah uh, presence or absence. And uh, basically what we did was, um, after processing the data sets, we started to build the model and we brought all the spatial data layers into R and generated 40,000 random points uh, over historical distribution range for cheetah. And in order to test hypotheses, we used random forest modeling to analyze the impacts of all these variables on cheetah presence and absence. Um, so based on these multiple diagnostic methods, our model suggests that time of arrival of agriculture is the most important variable in determining cheetah presence or absence. The other important variables were obviously human population density, sheep density, and protected area status. And, um, and, and interestingly, um, you know, these four important variables uh, predict predicted cheetah presence and absence with a 97% overall model accuracy. Um, so if we zoom in at the, on the different geopolitical regions, you know, uh, in Asia, in some parts of, of Asia and North Africa, you have very low human population densities. But those farmers have been operating in that landscape for, for such a long time that they've had enough time to eradicate uh, wild cheetah populations and other carnivore populations. If you look at uh, cheetah mortality in Asia, in Iran, 85% is, is human related, essentially unnatural. And, you know, if, 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 if you're experiencing this level of anthropogenic mortality, then there's very little uh, uh, room for, for basically, um, you know, population growth. If you look at the three ruminant species, sheep, uh, sheep density was the most important variable in, 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 in basically uh, determining cheetah presence. Goats are a lot hardier than sheep and cattle are too big for cheetah and cattle moms are generally quite protective. Uh, if you zoom in on West Africa and India, human population density kicks in. Um, just one uh, of relatively viable population of cheetahs left in the whole of West Africa. And, and India, over a billion people, you know, a very difficult place to survive as a wild cheetah. But if you look at West Africa, pre-independence West Africa, 1954, there were still 14 cheetah populations persisting. And um, this would have been the time to implement uh, a metapopulation strategy, um, because the opportunities for natural gene flow had gone. This would have been a time to bring in fencing. And that didn't happen. And only one of these 14 populations persists today. Um, East Africa protected area status is the most important variable. More than 60% of cheetahs remaining in East Africa occur within protected areas. In Southern Africa, very interestingly, uh, protected area status was not an important variable. And this is because in places like uh, 
Namibia and Botswana, human population densities are so low that cheetah can still persist in the landscape and livestock densities are sufficiently low that we can still coexist with wild cheetah populations. Um, so the current, as we know from this con conference and the various discussions, uh, the current conservation paradigm is one of coexistence with wildlife. You know, we're all aiming for a more holistic approach that incentivizes protection and promotes sustainable human wildlife coexistence across multiple land use landscapes. But the reality is that all wild cheetah populations in unfenced protected areas are declining. The only ones that are stable or increasing are the fenced populations. And this can be attributed to the effectiveness of predator-proof fencing in reducing the spatial overlap of cheetahs with human-dominated uh, human landscapes. So long gone are the lo wide open spaces for wildlife to roam freely. Just 5% of Africa looks like this. If you fly over Africa, you're more likely to see this. And uh, even if you go into Google Earth, uh, it's very easy to see where the protected areas are because they're the only bits of natural habitat left. And, um, you know, when we flew our first cheetahs into Malawi, Malawi's fenced, you could very easy see, easily see where the uh, fence line was separating, uh, you know, the elephants, lions, rhinos, and cheetahs from the agricultural landscape. And um, the sad news, unfortunately, is that, uh, you know, as conservationists in Africa, we've still got about another 150 years of anthropic, anthropogenic destruction ahead of us, of economic growth, of exponential human population growth. So we've got one hell of a job to pull our wildlife through this 150 years. And who knows, maybe in 200 years' time we can get to a point where people have been lifted out of poverty, where human population growth is tapering off, and we can pull down the fences. But we need to, to, to be serious about considering fencing as a tool to reduce human-wildlife conflict and to pull our biodiversity through this very difficult time ahead. So um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but basically, um, you know, it's very interesting if there's one country that has done very well at coexistence, it's India, where most of the people subscribe to the uh, Eastern religions, which advocate custodianship of nature. So without fences in India, they've managed to double their tiger populations, to increase their lion populations. Whereas in Africa, most of us subscribe to the Abrahamic religions, which uh, advocate human dominion over nature, which is very anthropocentric and, and destructive to the environment. So a lot to look forward to um, with the India reintroduction. Uh, so we'll see how things play out. Uh, these are my references, and thanks very much to our donors. <laughs>